Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Well, hiya, Pat. How you doing this bright and sunny afternoon? Pat? Alvin Peabody Cartwright. Oh, no. Oh, yes. He's called you. Yeah, he called me. He has a problem. Well, hasn't he always? Big emergency. That's right. Which means that you have a problem. Oh, no, 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 no. We haven't, Johnny. You have. Oh, well, now, Pat, let's talk about this, huh? Why, oh, why does the company pass all his frantic, fantastic problems on to us? So that you can pass them on to me? Yeah? Sure, so that I can collect all those fancy fees and commissions, have an excuse to pad out the little old expense account. Now, Johnny... After all, when you're serving a client as important as he is, why, uh, hang the expense. Oh, then you finally admit it. Huh? It's only because of the dough you collect that you put up with that wild, wacky old coot. No, no, wait, that isn't true. Oh, it isn't, huh? Well, I freely admit I've made a lot of money handling his problems over the years, a real sackful. Yeah? But more important, I've grown to like Alvin P. And I feel kind of sorry for him and all the messes he gets himself into. Uh Uh-huh. So, if he's having trouble again, if I can give him a hand... What the heck with the expense account? Right. Good, that'll save the company a lot of money. No, no, wait a minute, I didn't mean that. Oh, well, I wish you did. Cartwright's cost us plenty. More than any other client of any other company we act for. Would you rather he took his insurance somewhere else? Right. Maybe I can arrange it. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. I didn't mean that. Now, listen, uh, listen, Johnny. Okay, I'm listening. Drive on up to Lakewood and see him, will you? Right away? He particularly asked for me? You know he did. He always does. So will you do it? Yeah, sure, Pat. Only what's his problem this time? Johnny, I don't know. Huh? But you said he called you. That's right. And he didn't tell you? Sure he did. Well? Well, he told me one thing, told the insurance company something else. Heaven only knows what he'll tell you. Is there anything unusual about that? Nope, not a thing. So go ahead, Johnny. Go over and see him. Get him off my neck. Patrick, that I will. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the intriguing adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I you smoking more now, but enjoying it less. Have a real cigarette, have a camel. The best tobacco makes the very best smoke. Have a real cigarette, have a camel. Are you looking for flavor and mildness? If you're smoking more today, but enjoying it less, try Camels. The Camel blend of costly Turkish and domestic tobaccos has never been equal for rich flavor, easygoing mildness, real smoking satisfaction every time you light up. The best tobacco makes the best smoke. Have a real cigarette, a real cigarette, a real cigarette, have a camel. And now act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the merry-go-round matter. Doing a job for Alvin Peabody Cartwright was like uh, riding a merry-go-round, a shoot-the-shoots, a roller coaster, and a razzle-dazzle all in one. Anyhow, expense account item one, four bucks for a tank full of gas. And hoping the snow plows had cleared off the highway, I headed north to Lakewood. In my humble estimation, Lakewood is one of the prettiest little towns in all of New England, especially in the wintertime. The Cartwright place where the old man lives by himself is on top of a low hill beside the lake. Three or four acres, I'd say, with plenty of elms and towering oak trees guarding the sprawling old mansion. And now, at dusk, with a soft blanket of snow on everything, a group of skaters gliding gracefully over the frozen lake, and a horse-drawn sleigh loaded with happy kids circling around the edge of the lake. Well, it was mighty nice. Peaceful, too. Yeah, it was good being out here in the country again, breathing deep of the crisp, cold air. I felt real good. And I hoped the problem at hand would be no more serious than most of those that were handed to me by Mr. Cartwright. Hiya. Yes! 
don't just stand there letting in the cold. Don't you know it costs a lot of money to heat a place like this? Yeah, but it does. Well, how are you? Did you stop the snow off your feet? Yeah, I think don't I did. Don't want you tracking up the house. Now, what can I do for you, Mr. Mr. What? Um, what? Um, huh? Uh, uh, why, it's Johnny, Johnny Dollar. Oh, oh, and I know it's a little late, but Merry Christmas, Johnny. Merry Christmas to you. Well, thanks, Mr. Cartwright. The uh, same to you. I knew you wouldn't let me down, boy. Just throw your things here in the hall rack, will you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. sir, I knew you'd come. And so I saved it for you. Right in here, Johnny. Yeah, save what, sir? <laughs> save love. Save love. Why, your Christmas present, of course. You mean to say that's why you... Here want... you are, Johnny. Oh, well, now, yeah, listen. Go, go I... ahead, go ahead. Open it up and see if you like it. Oh, okay, but... Now, you shouldn't... Holy smoke. Well, well, <laughs> do you? These aren't diamonds on this Of course thing? they are. Why do you think it is? A piece of junk? Oh, well, no, this is too much, Mr. I Cartwright. don't see why, Johnny. Everybody should carry his money in a bill clip. Everybody. <laughs> Just think how I will impress the folks. But a bill clip studded with genuine diamonds. Well, you like it? Well, sure. Well, I don't know how to thank you, You sir. don't need to, boy. You don't need to. If you like it, that's all that counts. <laughs> so... Merry Christmas. Use it in good health and... and oh, 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 before you go. <laughs> yeah, let me wish you a happy new year, too. Belatedly. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, you, uh... You mean this is the only reason you call me up here? Uh, they, they, oh, of course not, Johnny. Can't, can't you see I'm in trouble? Uh, terrible problem. Terrible. Better tell me all about it, then. Come, Johnny, and I'll show you. And I hope to heaven you can help me with this. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Welcome, recording star Mel Torme. It's terrible trying to sing with a bad cold. So I always take four-way cold tablets to relieve cold miseries fast. Good idea. Tests of all the leading cold tablets proved four-way fastest acting. Four-way starts in minutes to relieve muscular pains, headache, reduce fever, calm, upset stomach, also overcomes irregularity. When you catch cold, try my way. Take four-way cold tablets. A fast way to relieve cold distress and feel better quickly. Four-way, only 29 cents. Now, here's a word about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. Had dandruff for years... Now get rid of it in three minutes with Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Three minutes with Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep unsightly dandruff away forever. Apply Fitch before wetting hair. Rub in one minute. Add water, lather one minute. Then rinse one minute. Every trace of dandruff goes down the drain. Three minutes with Fitch. Embarrassing dandruff's gone. Fitch can also leave hair up to 35% brighter. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And the merry-go-round matter. Better tell me what it's all about, Mr. Cartwright. What it's all about? <laughs> My nice new art gallery. What else? Now, come along. <laughs> you have an art gallery now? Johnny, ever since I went over to Paris last summer and saw that Louvre place with all those pretty things in it, I decided I'd better have an art gallery, too. <laughs> Maybe not as big, but with everything just as good. Well, the Louvre has some pretty valuable things. And by spending a bit of money, I have some things that even the Louvre couldn't get. Uh, here, I'll turn on the light. Ah. Ah. Well, then. <laughs> How do you like it? Wow. The gallery was 50 or 60 feet long, maybe 30 feet wide, with a high vaulted ceiling. A floor of solid marble. The tall, narrow windows were all of beautiful stained glass. Around the walls were some of the finest paintings I've ever seen. That's a Romney, Johnny. A genuine Romney. And you see this Matisse over here? And how about this Van Gogh? There were statues and various other sculptures. Beautiful tapestries, valuable urns and vases. Rare pieces of jewelry and, well, just about everything you could think of. Cartwright must have poured millions into this place, and all within the space of only a few months. Isn't it nice, Johnny? 
Unbelievable. And when I get tired of it, it's showing it off to people. <laughs> then I'll give all these pretty things to that big museum over in Hartford. I think they'll like them, too. Don't you? Oh, sure. But I can see your problem, all right. Problem? What problem? The reason you asked me to come here. Well, of course I did. Because of the possibility of theft. Theft? It was robbery. And Johnny, you've got to solve it for me. You mean it's already happened? Of course it has. Why do you think I sent for you? What's been taken? One of the most valuable things is my whole collection. A sacred painting, a holy picture. Only it was more than just a picture. It was an icon, Johnny. It was encrusted with emeralds and rubies. How big was it, Mr. Carteret? It was nine inches high and about four inches wide. Very heavy. It was hanging on the wall under that light, right there. Johnny, it was worth over... $90,000. A thing as valuable as that hanging right out in the open? So that people could see it? Yeah. And small enough to be hidden away under an overcoat. Well, yes, that's why... Uh... Oh, yeah. so I hadn't thought of that. Oh, I'm afraid you had it coming, Mr. Cartwright. You're lucky that Moore isn't missing. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean you alone in this place with all these valuable objects of art... Yeah, but... And letting all I... sorts of people in to see them? Well, pretty things like these have to be seen to be appreciated. Well, did you ever screen any of the people you let in here? <laughs> you think for one minute the kind of people who would come to admire these nice things would ever steal anything? Somebody did. Uh, oh. oh, yes, I did. Yes, I guess you're right, but... You were wrong about my being in here alone when it happened. What do you mean? Every day, Johnny, during the hours people were allowed to come in and look at my things. I had a guard on duty all the time. Oh, a registered peace officer? Mm, well, no, he just happened to be the first man who answered my ad. Oh, great. Where is he now? Well, after this happened yesterday, I, um... Oh, I suppose it was unkind of me, but I let him go. I telephoned him this morning, told him not to bother coming back, and... I sent him a check for a couple of hundred dollars. <laughs> Just severance pay. In other words, you paid him for robbing you. You know where he lives? Anything about him? Yeah, you know, I have his address in town. Okay, then you better give it to me. Uh, and he wasn't the only precaution I took, you know, sir. You see, I never let more than one person come here into the gallery at a time. And I always stayed with him. Always. So? Man, it was getting late. The guard was about to leave. But there was a knock on the door. And so I answered it. Uh-huh. And who do you think was there? I'll bite. Who? A sweet little old man. <laughs> he was all dressed in rags. Oh. He said he'd heard about the icon and he'd like to see it. Yeah. So I showed him in here. And did you stay with him? Uh, well, no, because just then there was another knock on the door. And who do you suppose it was? Okay, who this time? <laughs> Johnny, it was Jonathan. Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jonathan Peebles. <laughs> oh, yeah. My oldest and dearest friend. He lives down in New York. Oh, yes, I remember him now. <laughs> yes, he's the oldest, most loyal friend I have. Yeah, sure. He was the one who gave me a hand that time we all thought you were lost at sea. A bit of an eccentric doll. <laughs> Aren't we all? Uh, yeah, yes, but anyhow, it was Jonathan and, of course... He gave me the usual lecture. Lecture? Oh, you know, the sort of thing that you would. I'm afraid I don't understand. Uh, you Mr. know about it being wrong for me to have all these valuable things here in my home and being alone at night and maybe somebody might break in and try to kill me and get at them. And, uh, oh, that sort of nonsense. Nonsense, huh? Now, you listen to me, Mr. Carter. Yeah, anyhow, as we were about to come in here to the gallery, I saw that the old man was leaving. So naturally, I, I stayed out there at the front door to say goodbye to him. And to have the guard look him over and then pat his clothes and so forth. And, but then, Johnny... Uh, oh, Johnny, that poor old man. What happened? He tripped over the door sill and had a terrible fall. Well, the guard helped him up and made sure he wasn't badly hurt. And, well, I, I just gave him a few dollars just in case. And I had the guard drive him back to town. Uh-huh. And then you found the icon was gone. It, it was Jonathan who came out and asked me what I'd done with it. And Johnny, when I looked and it wasn't there, and I was so upset, I just... Well, well the first thing this morning, I, I put in that call for you. Well, that's probably too late to do any good, but give me the address of that guard you had on here and tell me what he and the old man look like. Yeah, that's right. Well, the guard's name is Gummy. It's what? Well, that's right. It's Gummy O'Banion. Gummy O'Banion? What's the matter with you, anyhow? Well, Don't you remember? 
Gummy O'Banion was mixed up in more rackets down in New York in the old days. Of course I remember that. Then why under the sun would you... he assured me that he's through with all that, that he's gone straight and he's retired. And he's the one you picked for a guard? Oh, brother. Surely you don't think that he, that Gummy... No, you want to bet. You know something? I'm glad that Mr. Cartwright didn't want to bet. As I said before, any case where he's involved, well, you can bank on just one thing. The solution isn't going to come from any logical process of deduction or series of sensible clues. Uh Uh-uh. It's going to come from way out in left field. And believe me, that's exactly what happened on this one. Constipation is something people don't talk much about. But it can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Now, a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, as close to natural acting as possible, and a medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Well, pleasant-tasting chocolated X-lax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. X-Lax is gentle. Next morning, it gives you the closest thing to natural action. And that's why many doctors and millions of people use X-Lax with complete confidence. X-Lax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity gently, overnight. Is X-Lax in your medicine cabinet? And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The address of Gummy O'Banion turned out to be little more than a shack at the south end of town. But there was a light inside, so I parked well on down the street and pulled a peeping Tom act at the window the light was coming from. The window was slightly ajar. Inside, sitting at a bare wooden table, guzzling beer, were O'Banion and a ragged-looking little old man. On the table between them was a stack of bills. Not only tens and twenties, but I spotted several fifties among them as they poured them over. Easy money like this, I would have went legit long before I did. Yeah, Tommy. And you know what? What, Tommy? Old Cartwright says he sent me 200 severance, too. What do you think of that, Doc? 200? That's right. So, with that and all this dough the other guy gives us for that act we pulled at the front door. Other guy? Why, Doc, you and me won't have to work for months. That's pretty good, huh, Tommy? Yeah, Doc, that's pretty good. Well, then open me up another bottle of beer, huh? Sure. Sure. Doc, I still don't get it. Why that other guy wanted us to make all that fuss for him there at the front door. You falling down and me helping you up and all. Uh, diversion, he call it, whatever that means. Diversion. Diversion. Yeah, and what'd you say his name is, the one that give us the dough, huh? Oh, crazy kind of name. Reminds me of a church like steeple, only it wasn't. Uh, I didn't wait to hear that name. I didn't need to. Because things had suddenly begun to add up the wrong way. Instead of disturbing the two lucky gentlemen, I got back into my car and drove. Drove hard. And I didn't stop until I got all the way down to New York, to a fancy apartment building on East 52nd Street. It was well after midnight, and the uniformed doorman was half asleep and a little grumpy about it all. Ah, uh, look, where do you think I am? Your brother's keeper or whatever it is they say? And that crazy old man... And you have no idea at all where he might be, huh? Uh, uh your name ain't Dollar, is it? What'd you say? I asked, is your name Dollar, Zoll? Yeah, that's right, Johnny Dollar. Why? Well, why don't you say so? Ed, yeah. old Coot left this note for you. He what? He, uh... Dear Johnny, I have tried all day to reach you by phone. phone, but with no success. Knowing you, I'm sure that sooner or later you will come to look for me here at my apartment. I can only ask your indulgence. My indulgence? And beg that when you return to Alvin Cartwright's home, you speak with me before you talk further with him. What? The icon, incidentally, is safely ensconced in the bottom of one of the large Roman urns there in the gallery. Sincerely, Sincerely, Jonathan Jonathan W. Peoples. But now, will somebody please tell me? Huh? What's the matter, mister? Here. Here's a five spot for your trouble. Well, thanks, Johnny. You're okay. So I drove on back to Lakewood, to Cartwright's home, after a quick stop for some breakfast along the way. Not only was there no guard at the front door, but the door was unlocked. And I wondered, had Jonathan Peoples deliberately left it that way for me? Hmm. Anyhow, I sneaked inside, and there, sure enough, in the breakfast room, their backs toward me, were the two wild old characters. Or maybe just one such and his really good friend. 
listen to me. Oh, fool, eh? Huh? That's right, I'm convinced of it. Oh, you are. Unless you'll solemnly promise me two things. Promise? Promise? Oh, what are you talking about? That you'll immediately, immediately, mind you, that you'll turn this whole collection over to a museum, the way you plan to do sooner or later but, anyway. But, but, Jonathan, I haven't got tired of it yet. No. Well, by the time you do, somebody will come here and bash in that silly head of yours. Or at least come here and steal some of those things. Oh, with me around there? I'd <laughs> just like to see anybody try to... Oh. Yes, that's right, the icon. Oh, it was such a lovely thing, too. And you'd like it back, wouldn't you? Are you crazy? Of course I'd like it back. Well, you'd also have to promise to have some honest, legitimate guards around here now, immediately, 24 hours a day. You and your ex-gangster. Yes, I guess I was wrong about him. Of course you were. He might have killed you. Unless you make those promises, Alvin, somebody will, you stupid, incompetent old... old... Don't you talk like that! But it's true, isn't it? Of course it, it is! Oh, dear, of course it is. This whole thing was silly right from the beginning, and, and losing that beautiful icon, it just... Would you, ups... uh, Set like myself. it back? Yeah, I'd do anything to have it back. Anything? Yes, anything. You can hear, can't you? I can <laughs> give it to you, Alvin. No, I don't care what you can do. All I care about is... is that... You? That's right. I have it. I'll be glad to give it to you. Jonathan. Jonathan. If Peter. you keep your word. You're a crook. That's what you are. I am not a crook. But if you have the icon, it's because you stole it. I did not. You're a thief. That's what you are, a thief. I am not. There's only one way you could have gotten it. No. By stealing. No, you silly old fool. Don't you see? Don't I see what? All I did was to hide it away from you in the hopes of knocking some sense into that thick skull of yours. Well, has it? Has it made you realize that you have no business keeping a valuable thing like that around here? Yeah. All, right. All, right. All, right. All right, Jonathan. I'll admit you did the right thing. You brought me to my senses. But now give it to me. Oh, come on, give it to me. Only on condition you make those promises to me. Didn't I say I would? Then do so. I do. Cross your heart? Yes, I cross my heart and I hope to die. But there, now. Now, give me back the icon. Well, I said I would, didn't I? Well? Well? Well, then do so. Well, I will. Well, now! All right, all right. And if you think for a minute that was the end of it, you're wrong. Those two wild old men sat there for the better part of an hour, squabbling, shaking their fists at each other, and a half dozen times they almost came to blows. But finally they ran out of breath, put their arms around each other, shed some tears of repentance, and then, as they've done so many times before, quietly, solemnly swore undying friendship for each other. What a pair. The expense account? Why bother? After all, by now, Alvin Peabody Cartwright has probably forgotten he even sent for me. So, yours truly, Johnny Dalton. And now our star has a few words for you about the case he'll investigate on next week's program. It's called the Sidewinder Matter, and the whole thing happens out in the middle of the great Mojave Desert. Believe me, it doesn't take long for me to realize the desert can be a mighty dangerous place. So join us, won't you? Right here on the station that brings you all the best in radio. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our story were Lawrence Dobkin, Howard McNear, Frank Gerstle, Will Wright, Forrest Lewis, and Joseph Kearns. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. A terrorized model races for the end of the road, shocking drama of suspense next on the CBS Radio Network. Better buys are your reward at Orange Motors for a Ford. Get your orange guarantee from the largest dealer in Albany in the heart of Auto Road. Orange is the place to go. Orange Motors has the ports, it's true. Plus 44 years of experience to Orange Motors. If you're wise, for better service, better fight. Want a new Ford right now? Come to Orange Motors and choose from a large selection of new 1960 Fords. Orange has new Fords and new Falcons, lots of them. For a better deal, buy Ford. Buy at Orange Motors, 799 Central Avenue, Albany. Want a new Ford right now? Go to Orange Motors right now. Better Ford buys used or new at 799 Central Avenue. Orange Motors, if you're wise, 
for better service, better fights. Radio 59, WROW, first on the dial, serving Albany, Troy, and Schenectady.